All right, now we're going to get down to work. All you mob who come here, you come here to not only just listen and listen to it, it's not just a talk fest. Um, I, I've been at this for a long, long time and, and my family keeps saying to me, well, when are you going to start doing something? You know, you've done all this research. And quite frankly, having spent the last 42 years um, from the time of the Aboriginal Embassy, one thing that I pursued that no one else did, and I went after the question of sovereignty never ceded. That's one of the things, signs we had at the Aboriginal Embassy when we first put it up. Land rights, we won land rights, and then them black bastards, and I say that with a great deal of <laughs> hatred in my heart for those people. I don't hate, but a lot of bitterness in my heart. We won land rights, we won it fair and square, and then they came and negotiated and they gave it away. Yeah? Well, they gave it away in a sense that <coughs> they created um, Mabo, what a lot of people don't understand is that Mabo um, took away the foundations of the whole Australian uh, system of governance, yes. land systems, ownership of land, yes. ownership of minerals, yes. ownership of fish, ownership of all the plants in this country. Yeah? Ma that's what Mabo did. Mabo wiped them right out. They knew it. That's why all them white fellas panicked. That's why it was all over the news and they were talking about certainty. You would go back, if you go back through all the media statements, it was all about certainty. It was always about creating an understanding of who <coughs> governs this country, right? So for all intent and purposes, what we don't understand about the Mabo decision um, is exactly how much power it gave to us as a people. And of course we couldn't, we, because we didn't have people out there understanding that system, and what flowed from Mabo, we were not able to jump on it before they started doing all the legislation. Right? Now, here is a document, and I think it's, there's a bit of work to be done, the editorial and all that sort of stuff. But this is a, this is a thing we, um, Ellie Gilbert and I were commissioned by the Penguin uh, Publishing Company to write a history of Australia. Uh, and. Um, so Ellie and I did research for about five years. We were back and forth to England doing all this stuff, but it all were, it was assisting us because we, you know, the stuff we needed to put in that book, we needed to research anyway and, and get all this stuff out of England. And um, so when we, when we, as we were travelling around um, writing this book, we ended up with a 146-page or a, I think nearly 200-page uh, manuscript, and we sent it off to them in England after we'd written it uh, for them to look for editors and and scribes to, to do all the stuff for this story. Then all of a sudden they said, no, we don't, we're not going to publish it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Everything that we <coughs> funded you for, it's all yours. You, did, you fulfill the contract, it's finished. Yeah? But they wouldn't publish it. And the, the, some of the reasons they wouldn't publish is that this, the, this is a chapter in that book. And this is a chapter called Admissions Against Interest. Admissions against interest is one of the worst things you can do in any legal jurisdiction. You, so it's like going into a court and say, yeah, I killed him, but he, he had it coming. Yeah. <coughs> now, they're, they're not going to... So you're going to have to have a very clever lawyer to say why you killed that fellow and that you were justified in killing that fellow. But to say that, that's an, that's an admission against interest. You walk in like them poor old blackfellas up Moree, an admission against interest. Another group of blackfellas went in and complained and said, oh, they gave money to the Aboriginal organisation under the constitution. They had no right to give it. And so the ATSIC went in and charged them to old blackfellas for misappropriation of funds from a housing company fund. They went in and they said to the judge, but your honour, we, we gave it to an Aboriginal organisation as a sponsorship. And the judge said, I feel sorry for you. He said, but under your constitution, you don't have a right to donate anything to anybody and sponsor anybody. And so you gave $20,000 for your sports team to sponsor all your people to go to a football match and a knockout. And uh, those poor fellows ended up losing the organisation. They wound the company up and they got prosecuted. And, they had, and because they were honest, they said, we passed the resolution, we had to move it. They said, don't matter. The resolutions mean nothing because it's not written in your constitution. As a result, you are guilty of misappropriation of, of funds from your organisation, and so we fine you um, $100 each, 
and you are on, placed on a bond for two years. So now they've got a criminal record of misappropriating funds from their own Aboriginal organisation. And just because it wasn't in the Constitution they were allowed to do that, that's an admission against interest. They admitted that they tried to help their own mob, but it wasn't, the court will not take notice of that. So, as in the last two days, we've been talking about all these court cases, yeah? And I've been quoting court cases dating right back to the 1830s. Right, the first one being 1829, R versus Ballard. Crown, R versus um, Ballard, and it means um, regalia, uh, the royal mob. Now, what we have in all these cases, in those first three cases, is statements in the court which really tells everybody that Aboriginal people own everything they have here and that we have no right to interfere with it all. The decisions of those courts have never been overturned. Mabo actually supported everything that was said in the 1820s, 1830s and 1840s. Mabo supported everything. And the key thing is where Mabo said our law yeah, um, is not a construct of the, of the common law, but it's now recognised by the common law. Now, I keep saying that because people tell me that if you say it far, long enough and as often as enough, people start believing you. Yeah? <laughs> so I say again, Aboriginal law and culture is a, not a construct of the English law, but it's recognised now by the common law of Australia. So what does that mean? That means, basically, that if you know your law on your country, then white fellas can't interfere with you. There's no way in the world they can interfere with you. They have no legal jurisdiction whatsoever. And in the court also, Mabo also said that our rights, our law and culture is not alienable by any other parliament, any other legal system. So the High Court of Australia cannot make a determination if we apply our law and custom to anything that we do. The other thing is, when we, when we do things on our land, those white fellas have to prove how they got authority to do things on our land, like the state governments. You see, we now, we go home, and the recommendation is that you go home. Identify your boundaries. Okay? Only deal with your mob, the mob that you have authority with. Okay? Don't try and do it with anyone else because you have no authority with anyone else. So if you belong to the Ori Ori Nation, you belong to the Ualia Nation, you belong to uh, what they call them mob up there, the Gidja Nation in the Kimberley, you belong to those nations, and you start doing things inside your boundary and you set your governance up, and the way you set your governance up is that you need to, if you can do it proper way, traditional way, how it was always done, or in the alternative, you do it part traditional way and you get the mobs to agree that we adopt and change, or we adapt and we change the way we want to govern. That's your legal right. That's a process of evolution, and it's a legal right to make your choice as to how you want to govern and what sort of government you want. But your first challenge from here is to go on, mark your boundaries, and then pull your people together and say, let's, let's create a government. Let's tre create a governance system. If you don't do that, you're really blown into the wind. Yeah? And then when you do that there, after you do that there, then the next thing you've got to do is do a declaration of independence. Now, we've already got all the, con all the templates for all this. Yeah? So we can give you the templates to take it home. And we can tell you, and you go home and you fill in the gaps and put your names in instead of my mob name, and you, you create all that there. As soon as you do your Declaration of Independence, it's what you do a, what they call a Universal Declaration of Independence. These UDIs, these Universal Declarations of Independence, are now recognised by the international law all over the world. Right? That's how Kosovo became independent. That's how um, Bosnia Herzegovina became independent after they had a civil war. And there's other nations in Africa um, who have done these 
independent stands as well, and they they're now they're recognised by the international community. So the independent uh, declaration. So who do you send the universal declaration, uh, unilateral declaration of independence to? You send it to the Queen of England, and you send a copy of it to the Governor General, and a copy of it to your governors within the states. <clears throat> when you send those. When you send them to the state governors and the attorney uh, governor general, the first thing is you send it to the Queen in England. So you send it by registered mail. Now, the Queen of England is still the Queen of Australia. She's the Queen of Western Australia. She's the Queen of New South Wales, right? And she is a queen for every state because every state has a different constitution and she's the head of that state. So we, Australia, has seven queens locked up in one. Now, just one more on this. To understand how, we, how we're doing this, the governor of the state, and the gov in particular the governor general of Australia, the governor general of Australia is in charge of all military. And all instructions come from England. Yeah. And so he's the boss. So he can, con he can control everything. And so if, you, if um, you want, or if the state wants to go to war, they have to get everything authorised through him, through the governor, governor general. They can't, the parliament can't declare war. Only the governor can sign off it and declare the war. Representing the Queen, but he won't, he'll never do that unless he gets instructions from England. England will make those instructions first. So, what does this mean then? What we said in the first couple of days has been to try and demonstrate to you all and put it in your mind that we are at war. We have been from day one. When Governor Philip came here, he was to apply the rules and disciplines of war and that was, under, that was his instruction. So people, if you had the opportunity, we can sit down here and I can tell you about all the little things that they've been doing all these years and all of those things that they've been doing to us have been acts of war. Very subtle, and they've been doing it without a gun, they've just been doing it with a pen. And they've been putting people in power to do these things, and they do it according to their law. Yeah. Most of the stuff, like the intervention I said yesterday, and I'll say it now again, the Northern Territory intervention would never have got through the Parliament of Australia. No way in the world had they put it to the Parliament of Australia. So they exercised the use of the war powers. And that's how they got it. And the only person who had to sign off was the Governor-General at the request of the Executive Government of Australia. So John Howard and his Cabinet can make a decision, say this is important, take it to the Governor, and then they sign off on what they call an emergency response. That's why it's called the emergency response, right? Um, Northern Territory emergency response. And um, the emergency response is in fact defined as uh, martial law. So they've implemented martial law in the Northern Territory. So there are other things if we look at the, let's look at the uh, Native Title Act for example. The Native Title Act, the way in which they've constructed the Native Title Act is that we have to go through a court procedure, we have to go and get evidence to prove who we are. That's an act of war. It's an act of war because they're suppressing our free rights as people. As Justice um, French said when he came, on to power, came into power, um, as the Chief Justice, um, the first thing he said um, in, a, in a speech uh, before he took up the position as um, Chief Justice of the High Court, he said, the Native Title Act is an injustice to Aboriginal people. It shouldn't be them proving to us how they're connected to the land. We should be proving to them how we got the land from them. Did he, say that? Hey? Did he, say he that? did say that. He did say that. So, now, in the last couple of days, um, we've been showing you all these different court cases. Yeah? And I'll just read, read this one, for example. Yeah? This is 1829. Yeah? It says an Aboriginal native of this territory called Dirty Dick, they called him Ballard for that purpose, it, Dirty Dick didn't sound too good, had been community, had committed to trial in the Sydney Magistrate for willful murder of another Aboriginal native called Robert Barrett, who, 
was killed in an affray between two tribes of his countrymen under circumstances of great cruelty. The prison, the prison of Dirty Dick was now put to the bar. And then they said, and this is what the judge said, yeah, Judge Dowling said, until the Aboriginal native of this country shall consent, either actual or by implication, to the uh, interposition of our laws in the administration of justice for acts committed by themselves upon themselves, I know of no reason, human or divine, which ought to justify us interfering with their institutions, even if such interference were practicable. But all analogy fails when it is, when it is attempted to enforce the law of a foreign country amongst a race of people who owe no frailty to us and over whom we have no natural claim or acknowledgement of supremacy. Now, that their decision of Justice, Willard, Justice Dowling in the Supreme Court of New South Wales in 1829 says it all. And we've, been, we've had the curtain pulled over our eyes all these years. These fellows don't have any jurisdiction over us whatsoever. They never have. Never have. And it's the way they've educated us to think like them, because that's why they stopped us talking language. Yes. Yeah? As soon as they stop you talking language, you start thinking like them. Yeah? And that's proof, because when I go to meetings with my old mob and they sit down there and they say, oh, how are we going to do this here? One, one, you'll always get one fellow say, why don't you apply to the government for some money? Yeah? They got us imprisoned. Yeah. And so, when you go home now, I'm showing you that what we're going to do is we're going to create templates for you. We'll create templates for every nation. And we'll create, you, all of you who are here, with that uh, international lawyer there, these fellows are international lawyers and they know how to play the international rule of law to cut off the power. <coughs> and so what we're going to do, and my participation in all of that as a trained lawyer, and I gave up my practice in 83, but I've done a lot of work in the United Nations, I've done a lot of work overseas and I've looked at a lot of countries and when I was with the NAC I went around the world and looked at treaties all over the place. Yeah, so um, if I can boast, I'm no slouch and I know what I'm doing. And so the position basically is we have the power now and I just want to show you how to use it. But I can't show you how to use it if you haven't got the ability to go home and pull your people together. If you can't do that, well then you've got a few years to go. But if you can do that now, as the order you ought to have, my mob have, the, some of the, most of the um, people up in the East Kimberleys there, have, have, they're ready to go. There are a number of other nations in New South Wales who are ready to go. And um, one now, I think in, or there's three in North Queensland, We've, I've been working with them right up there in Mariba and uh, Cairns and right up that early part of that uh, North Queensland there. And so they want me to come up there now and start working more with them. They've done all this stuff. Richard Evans, um, Richard's taken a different pathway. Um, and um, the way Richard is, is going is simply that um, there is a power amongst these people which allows for the appointment of a person who is ruler over that country. And no doubt, and I can assure you that there are similarities in a lot of other places. We have a process where one person becomes that boss. And I talked about this the other day when I said, all them people who say that them poor old fellows who were given king's plate were traitors, you know, that's so wrong. That is so wrong to say they were traitors. Because you see, when the Whitefellas came, they were instructed to find out who the leaders were. <coughs> They were given those instructions. When you go out there and you meet the people, find out who the leader is. And so when they went out and they found out, they'd ask them blackfellas, under our law and culture, not everyone can talk for camp, country. Not everyone can. Yeah? And they'll say, oh, if you want to know about our country and you want someone to make decisions about our country, you're going to talk to that old fellow there. Or you're going to talk to that old woman over there. Yeah? 
And you see, they're the ones who make the decision. They get the final say over the country. They get the final say. When it comes to socially, as we described the other day, that's the community generally. Yeah? But when it comes to law, proper law, you ask that old fellow there. Yeah? You go to that man who's been given all that power. That's why they put that king's plate there. So they knew who to talk to. One thing them king fellows did, never did, would give them a piece of paper to say they own the country. Then we can swear at them, then we can call them all sorts of names, but they never did that. They held their position and they talked for their people. Uncle Cole. Yeah, I'm talking about the pen plate. Uh, my grandfather, great grandfather, Edward Walker, uh, died in 10, and uh, we had it for years. He wasn't an he died. She was the only girl in the Walker family. One of the cousins took it from the house and never ever saw it again. It's very important. Yeah. You see, the thing is, um, when, when I wrote to the Queen, my mob wrote to the Queen in 2010, uh, 2013, we made the declaration in 2013, all the elders signed off on everything, you know, we, had, we set the council up and the council of elders, and, you know, I'm, because I'm ceremony boss, the boss of all that knowledge, you, in, in white man's way, you'd say he the sheikh or he the king. But that's not how it is. That's, we don't say those things. Yeah? But he's the boss who makes decisions. I'll, I'll talk to all the mob. I'll never do anything without their decision. Yeah? But under the process, when you look at the family traits, my mob on three places were the bosses on my three family um, tree. And they were all the bosses and they were all the kings. They were the ones given the king's plate. And I was then advised that the Queen didn't respond to us in the first instance because she had no idea who I was and what my standing was in that, in that nation. So then I was then sort of alerted to the fact that, wait a minute, she's a sovereign, she's a Queen. Go back to the Pacific Island Act of 1875 where Queen Victoria said that she did not claim sovereignty or dominion over the people's places and, the land, uh, places and spaces, and she did not take away dominion or sovereignty of their rulers and chiefs. So all those powers are still in place. That law, by the way, is still law in this country, and that law can only be changed by Queen Elizabeth taking that law away because it's an order in council. The Parliament of England can't do it, the Australian Parliament can't do anything about it. So then I wrote her a second letter, and I sent it back to the Queen, and this time I put down who my family was, my genealogy. And according to them, when they see that there, that's when they recognise who you are, that's when they recognise the leadership status of that person, and from that day onwards, Queen Elizabeth has been writing to me, Giller, because that's the name my grandfather gave me on the day I was born. Giller, Michael Anderson, head of state or leader of the Ulao Nation. Of course. Uh, talking about the ten plate, uh, my friend had to go to court once. Uh, at my mama, and he said, "Oh, well, you got a pain a bit." And I thought, no, I took a little stone, told me wrap it up in a dirty old bit of cloth, took it in. And the mayor's grave, I guess, let me just stand up to give evidence. And I said, you put my hand on the Bible. I said, Your Honour, I cannot put my hand on that Bible. I said, because there's too many lies that have been told on that Bible over the years. And I pulled out, I said, Your Honour, I want to swear by this. I pulled out this dirty old cloth and had this little stone from me. So he accepted that. Yeah. And my case was dismissed. Because they realised that they did not have jurisdiction over you. Yeah? That's why it was dismissed. I've written a number of cases, uh, defence cases for some people, and just put it in writing, so you don't have to go to court before a judge, you don't need a lawyer. You put all the paperwork in, and people have walked out of court with that paperwork and my arguments right there. So you don't make a big issue of it. One woman, she went to the Supreme Court in Sydney, and I took her down there and Anyway, the judge, everything was in writing. The judge issued a written, written decision. And when the judge gave that written decision, he dismissed everything, wiped out all of the, char uh, all of the, um, all the, all of the um, punishment that was given to her by the magistrate court, supported by the district court, 
And when we walked out of the court, she said to me, do I go and appeal this now to the full bench of the Supreme Court? I said, no, you don't. Go home and don't bloody do it again. Yeah? You're finished. You're free. Get out of here. Two weeks later, she rang me up and she said, they caught me again. Yeah. <laughs>